a motorcycle that makes music. You see somebody with motion, maybe slowed down, really is like music, which kind of makes sense given Yamaha's history with musical instruments. <laughs> From music to motorcycles, Yamaha has always focused on beauty and design. We were the last Japanese company to begin making motorcycles, but the first to emphasize what a motorcycle looked like. One of the things you'll hear from Yamaha a lot is the phrase, Kondo. Kondo is an old Japanese philosophy describing how music and beauty impact the human spirit. We didn't just sell pianos, we sold the enjoyment of music. But could Kondo sell motorcycles? Simple, compact, powerful. That has been our design concept from the very first motorcycle. two very different kinds of music, both influenced by the impact of beauty on human emotions. Exciting uh, beauty uh, performance. How did Yamaha connect the ancient Japanese philosophy of Kondo to bikes? And why did the largest piano company in the world decide to make music with a motorcycle? Every year from late March to early May, it's cherry blossom season in Japan. In a tradition dating back to the 8th century, the Japanese take a break from school or work to stroll among the blossoms. The tradition is called Haname the Japanese version of literally taking time to stop and smell the roses. Haname is just one expression of Kondo, the Japanese philosophy describing how beauty impacts the human senses. Kondo can describe the sound of a Yamaha piano that represents more than a century of unmatched musical craftsmanship. Hamamatsu, Japan. It was here in the year 1900 that Torakusu Yamaha crafted the first piano ever made in his country. Mr. Torakusu Yamaha originally only repaired pianos, which in the late 1800s were only imported from Europe. Then he learned how to build his own piano and started his own music business. Soon, Japan was no longer importing pianos. Instead, the new Yamaha Music Company began exporting pianos all over the world. One of the key things that helped create Yamaha pianos was that in this region of Japan, there was a lot of lumber that was especially good for producing great pianos. By 1904, a Yamaha piano was on display at the World's Fair in St. Louis, Missouri. Today, at the Yamaha Motor Company Museum in suburban Hamamatsu, the company still honors its history as the world's largest piano manufacturer with a baby grand sitting center stage.
A three-pointed tuning fork is Yamaha's logo. It is more than just a simple connection between music and machines. It's a constant reminder that Kondo, the impact of beauty on the senses, is at the very core of the company. A lot of people are surprised to find out that those are tuning forks, even though they look like it, but people don't make the connection right away until they kind of get involved with motorcycling and find out that the tuning forks are Yamaha, even on a motorcycle. So uh, the connection is there from the musical instrument thing right down to the two wheelers. But coming out of World War II, no one in Japan needed a piano. Daily living was focused on survival, shelter, food, and inexpensive transportation. So Yamaha asked itself what it could do to stay in business. The answer was to build motorcycles. Yamaha developed special metal technologies that were used in the design and manufacturing of pianos. After World War II, the company realized it could use these special metal technologies to make motorcycles. In August 1954, Yamaha introduced its first motorcycle, the YA-1. It was a 125cc single-cylinder bike with an engine design copied from a German company. But its shape and colors were unique. It was immediately nicknamed the Akatumbo. In English, Akatumbo means the red dragonfly. This is the very first Yamaha. At that time, motorcycles in Japan were painted black and there was little attention being paid to the language of sculpture and design. But Yamaha put an emphasis on design and so we created an aerodynamic shape for the fuel tank and the overall shape was simple and compact. It makes sense that Yamaha has always put a, a lot of emphasis on styling. Um, I mean, a, a piano is a beautiful instrument in a lot of ways. Uh, and it, it, has to be, it has to be designed and styled. It's an aesthetic, almost a piece of uh, working furniture, as it were. Um, so it makes sense that Yamaha put a lot of emphasis on the look and styling of their bikes, even from day one. Rushing to catch up with other motorcycle companies, Yamaha wasted little time taking the YA-1 racing. In 1955, just weeks after the first YA-1 had rolled off the production line, Yamaha entered the Red Dragonfly in the two most important races in Japan, the Mount Fuji Hill Climb and the Asama Volcano Race. Back in the day, uh, the first motorcycles were functional, functional bikes to get around on, they were transportation. Yamaha got into the racing thing pretty early with their win at the uh, Mount Fuji Hill Climb. That was a big deal. Red Dragonfly carried a powerful sting. After winning the Mount Fuji hill climb, the bike won the very first running of the Osama Volcano races. We had to focus on quality and performance, and racing was a good way to demonstrate those qualities. So we started racing in 1955. Excited by its racing success, people wanted to buy the bike. By the end of 1955, Yamaha had 274 employees building 200 motorcycles a month. Just one year after entering the motorcycle business, Yamaha introduced the YD-1. A completely new motorcycle with an engine twice as big as the Red Dragonfly. The YD-1 had a two-cylinder, 250cc engine designed by Yamaha engineers. The YD-1, our first two-cylinder bike, is very much a Japanese original and not based on other motorcycles imported from other countries. The YA-1 was partly based on a German motorcycle, but the YD-1 was completely a Japanese design. The YD-1 was not only a 250, but it was a twin, and I think it really expanded the scope of what post-war Japanese rider could do on a motorcycle. It could take him uh, longer distances, uh, 
was a, a bigger, more performance-oriented motorcycle. Uh, it kind of pointed the way to where Japan was going to go in terms of their motorcycle production. The YD1 would become a classic statement of Yamaha's design philosophy. This is the first twin-cylinder Yamaha. We didn't want to cover the engine or any of the other parts. Letting people see those parts was our design philosophy. Atsushi Ishiyama is the keeper of the flame for Yamaha's design philosophy. He's been designing Yamaha motorcycles for more than 50 years. We use color to create a two-tone fuel tank. We use the color white to make the tank shiny in the light, which makes it more beautiful. There are times when Yamaha's really kind of stood out. Yamaha tended to take some chances on the styling and the color use and everything, and uh, uh, it seems to have worked, worked really well for them. It was the original Yamaha Super Sport motorcycle. Just three years after getting into the motorcycle business, Yamaha took the next big step. They began selling motorcycles overseas. In 1958, the YD-1 became the first Yamaha motorcycle ever sold in the United States. You know, my father used to ride uh, the early Yamaha air-cooled twin two-stroke 250s. I really thought those were really cool bikes. I think it also put a bit of a performance angle into the Japanese uh, market where there maybe hadn't been one before, a performance-oriented uh, angle, which really kind of paved the way for Yamaha and their racing success with two-strokes. In the late 1960s, Yamaha created the first motorcycle ever designed from the ground up as a bike you could ride on the street or in the dirt. Their timing was perfect. The DT1 went on sale in America as baby boomers were coming of age. Times were good, people had money, and they were looking for adventure. It was the right bike at the right time. Baby. The DT-1 was first sold in 1968. It was really popular in the United States. It was an off-road trail bike. Right at a time when Americans were really getting excited about motorcycling, DT-1 came about and said, look, you can ride it on the street, you can ride it on the dirt. And the thing about the DT-1 is it was such a good, basic design. The DT-1 was another example of Kondo the ancient philosophy of connecting shapes and beauty with human emotions. For American riders, the DT1 really hit an emotional chord. The DT1 was one of those bikes that really covered a lot of ground and introduced untold thousands and thousands of people into the off-road sport of motorcycling and uh, really bridged the gap from street to dirt riding. In 15 years, Yamaha had gone from copying a German bike to creating designs of its own. The DT1 even created a new segment in the motorcycle market. What happened next would make Yamaha the second largest motorcycle company in the world. In 1970, Yamaha took a major risk investing serious time and money in building its first motorcycle with a four-stroke engine. In 1970, we built the XS1. It was a breakthrough for Yamaha because it had a four-stroke engine. Before that time, all the motorcycles had two-stroke engines in which the oil and gasoline had to be mixed. The XS1 was called the XS650 in the States. Its two-cylinder engine was modeled after classic British designs, except the Yamaha version made a lot more power. The Yamaha 650 Twin was just an amazing motor. It was very, very durable, it was fast, and it stuck around for a long time and was a basis for a lot of really good motorcycles. And uh, it's become one of Yamaha's real classic motorcycles, the 650 Twin.
The XS650 had one of the most advanced engine designs of the day. But as the 1970s drew to a close, Yamaha would need a new cutting edge design. A new bike, but one still created with a true sense of condo. Tokyo International Exhibition Center. Built along the Tokyo Bay, it's one of the largest venues in the city. Its nickname is Tokyo's Big Sight. The hall has 250,000 square feet of exhibition space. That's five football fields under one roof. Each year, the center hosts one of the premier motorcycle events in the world the Tokyo International Motorcycle Show. This is where Japanese motorcycle companies always debut their latest models to the public. In 1980, Yamaha introduced the RZ250 at the Tokyo Motorcycle Show. Its shape rocked the motorcycle world. It was Yamaha's newest expression of its classic philosophy of condo, the impact of beauty on the senses. It's very narrow, the knee grip is tight, it's a very organic design. The rider's body can fit into the machine completely. The bike and rider become one. Today, Kondo continues to define Yamaha's design philosophy. Yamaha has, has the ability to blend that ergonomic package into a bike that gets around the racetrack really well, and also a bike that is very streetable. The, the, the motorcycle can be taken out and played with in the canyons, driven to work. You can even ride it cross country if you need to because it's not a crazy race bike. This is a sketch of a motorcycle that represents the union of a mechanical machine with the organic human body. The motorcycle looks like a creature that expresses the celebration of life. People all over the world have a common appreciation for beauty. When we design, we think, how can we move people's hearts? We believe a motorcycle is a creature, not just a simple machine. We focus on putting emotions into motorcycles. For many riders, the ultimate impact of condo, the way to really stir human emotion, can best be found in the heart of a full-blown sport bike. In 1985, we built our first sport bike, which has evolved into the R1 series today. The R1 series was a styling revolution that has influenced the look and shape of almost every modern sport bike. Something animalistic and edgy, almost insect-like um, with the eyes. And I think Yamaha really did kind of start the trend that you see now on everybody's big inline four-cylinder bikes, the sport bikes, is that, uh, that look that the R1 generated. It's 10 years ago, doesn't seem like 10 years ago, but uh, the R1 was really a breakthrough sport bike. Bike, no, ma. Its shape is like a bullet, a bullet in the wind. Much of our inspiration is taken from observing nature around us and like living creatures in the animal world, lions and tigers. This motorcycle has two eyes. The R1 was introduced in 1998 as Yamaha's most powerful sport bike. It had a 998cc motor producing 150 horsepower.
One year later, Yamaha revealed the R6, a 600cc middleweight version of its sport bike. Both machines continued the condo connection of man and motorcycle. The most important thing about the R1 is the performance leap it represented in 1998 when it first came out. It was like nothing else. You know, we're used to uh, incremental increases. The next year is last year's bike plus 3%, maybe 5%, you know. Up to that point, nobody had built a leader bike quite like it. But nobody else had spent 50 years perfecting the use of metal in a piano sounding board. How would that help Yamaha when it came time to build a bike? This is where the R1 and R6 are built. Yamaha's huge Awata factory complex in Hamamatsu. Iwata building number one is the final assembly plant for Yamaha sport bikes. On our newest bikes, the biggest challenge was developing electronic engine controls that would help the rider and provide more of a human sense or human feel to the bike. Inside the factory, that human feel of the engine is checked by a test rider on each new bike. Each bike has what's called a fly-by-wire control system. Instead of traditional cables, a tiny computer connects the throttle with the engine. That computer can make 1,000 calculations a second as it constantly monitors and adjusts the engine's fuel and air mixture. It's got fly-by-wire throttle, which to me, that's what we should be doing. We should be leading with technology, getting rid of cables and getting rid of those things and working toward electronics. Now, I'm not saying I want every one of my bikes to be cutting edge technology, but when I go to the dealer to buy a new bike that I can take to the racetrack and go quick on and enjoy, I'd like it to be up at the forefront of technology. The 600cc motor in the R6 cranks out 130 horsepower. And the bike's fly-by-wire technology makes all that power available almost instantly. Media throttle response, big power. For a 600, you know, one of the most powerful 600s you can buy. Just as hard-edged as in anything that's ever been sold for street use. <laughs> The new R1 engine puts out 158 horsepower sitting still. But beauty can increase performance. Four special vents carved into the R1's bodywork create a vacuum effect. Cold air is pushed into the engine while hot air is drawn out of the exhaust. The special airflow adds as much as 30 horsepower when the R1 reaches top speed. Both the R1 and the R6 have what Yamaha calls a human feel. It's one way to describe the relationship between man and machine, a relationship based on good communication between bike and rider. The R6 communicates, and that's why I think so many people go quick on it. That's why it's a secret, and that's why so many people love the R6. It talks to you and tells you where the limits are. The R6 is light and quick and very easy to turn in a corner. The R1 is more powerful and has a very strong torque curve, which helps it accelerate very quickly. The Awata factory complex has been building Yamaha's latest generation of sport bikes since 1998. Things here change quickly, with new R1 and R6 models being introduced every other year. 
The development of a sport bike is very difficult because as soon as a new model is ready for production, you must begin designing the next model that will replace it. There's one constant here. Each new motorcycle reflects Yamaha's philosophy of making motorcycles that look good and are fun to ride. Sports bike. Our emphasis in building sport bikes is to make them handle very well in corners and accelerate very quickly because that's the way many people like to ride. But at Yamaha, even the engineers are focused on beauty. We put an emphasis on making sure riders enjoy the beauty of our motorcycles. So we think it's important to study beauty and figure out ways to balance the beauty of the bikes with the performance of the bikes. Beauty and art shouldn't be separated from performance and efficiency. And Yamaha has that pretty clearly. You look at the way their bikes flow together and the way they choose the materials, even the colors, right? Even the wheel colors and, and the, the way they finish the fork legs. They've, you can see Kondo in those bikes. I think one of the greater successes of the R1 is in terms of styling because they established a look and they haven't really departed from that look. You see an R1, you know it's an R1. It takes a little more than an hour for a new R1 to complete its trip down the final assembly line inside building number one at the Iwata factory complex. When it's finished, it's more than a motorcycle. It's a mechanical object designed to marry man with machine. I'm five foot eight, that Yamaha fits me perfectly. The R1, the way the bars come back, the way the fuel tank is, is made and sculpted, the way the seat and the foot pegs relate, it just fits me. Just my personal, I like it. And different people and different sizes and different mentalities fit different bikes. But isn't that a big part of the sport, is what fits you, what makes you feel right? It makes me feel like a Grand Prix racer when I ride it. The emotional, or feeling side of the R1, that's Kondo. But would Kondo keep Yamaha successful on the racetrack? The only way to find out was for Yamaha to go racing at the world championship level. Japanese company to get into the motorcycle business, Yamaha has always used racing as a way to catch up. Yamaha has used racing to develop its motorcycles since the beginning of the company. Racing is a real-world laboratory. We develop new technologies and our engineers learn from racing. and played a huge role in Yamaha's racing history. In 1978, Kenny Roberts became the first American to ever win a world championship. This is the bike and the man that uh, cooked so many of us on motorcycle riding and sport bikes. Kenny Roberts on the Yamaha YZR500. Roberts was not only a remarkable rider, he was a self-taught engineer. He helped Yamaha develop a new aluminum chassis and suspension system for his race bikes. He came up with the idea of using a smaller diameter tire on the front wheel compared to the back. It made the bike more stable at high speeds, but harder to slow down going into corners. Roberts didn't seem to mind the trade-off. Roberts was also one of the first riders anywhere that used his knee to balance a bike 
in a corner. This guy, Roberts, and his bike. For Yamaha, I put him on the map. I mean, here's an American going over and winning the world championship on a Yamaha. In 1983, Eddie Lawson, a young rider from California, joined Kenny Roberts on the Yamaha team. They put him on Yamaha over there, teamed with Roberts. Rob Robert showed him the ropes, and then Lawson just took over. Eddie Lawson was known as Steady Eddie. He won three world championships and set the stage for a third American named Wayne Rainey. Checking out Lawson's bike is, uh, is an example of the progression of Yamaha. And he developed that bike into something that uh, Wayne Rainey then took on and won championships with. Wayne Rainey not only won championships, but did it three years in a row. From 1990 to 1993, he was unbeatable, winning three consecutive world titles. Wayne is an amazing guy, amazing rider. Fastest guy in the world three years in a row, and really someone that I tried to pattern my riding after as much as I could, to whatever level I could. Wayne Rainey rode a Yamaha race bike called the YZR500. It was wickedly fast, with the emphasis on wickedly. There was times, not a lot of times, that I could ride the bike and be uh, ahead of the bike, and I was in control totally. I knew exactly what the bike was going to do before it did it. Those four-cylinder two-strokes were just nasty, uh, ugly things that want to throw you off at just about any moment. In the early 1990s, Grand Prix bikes were notorious for being very unpredictable in how their engines delivered power. You could go from 90 horsepower to an instant 150 horsepower in the matter of, in the matter of you know, a few hundred feet. And that's where the thing exploded, and that's where they were the most difficult to ride. I got on Rainey's 500, and it wheelied out of turn two in fourth gear. It wheelied in fourth gear at well over 100 miles an hour. They could get away from you so easy because of that burst of horsepower. After one lap, I had to take a lap off. I was shaking so badly. My hands were so pumped up. My eyes were a little bit bigger than that. Uh, I was completely freaked out by it. I remember telling Wayne, how could you possibly ride that anywhere near anybody else? How could you race anybody with that thing? It was so fast. A lot of the times it felt like you were riding a motorcycle that, that, has, um, that didn't want to be ridden in a straight line, that's for sure. This is Wayne Rainey's favorite racetrack, the Laguna Seca Motor Speedway in Monterey, California. We're one of the top 10 road courses in the world, and because of its technicalities and because of its elevation changes. First developed as a horse ranch in 1867, the land became Fort Ord in 1917. The U.S. Army used it as an artillery range. In 1957, local businessmen bought the land and carved the racetrack through the hills. But the track wouldn't stay in private hands for long. It is uh, owned now by Monterey County Parks. Uh, it is a park, it operates as a park every day. A park that would become Wayne Rainey's backyard. Rainey bought a house and moved to Monterey just to be close to the track. That's just one example of his passion for motorcycles. 
Wayne has certainly had a tremendous impact on this facility. In the mid-90s, Grand Prix bikes were so fast, Laguna Seca was no longer considered a safe racetrack. Wayne Rainey convinced Yamaha to fund a total renovation of the track. Rainey is the man who brought international motorcycle racing back to Laguna Seca. All of us that have been lucky enough to attend the Grand Prix at Laguna Seca should thank Wayne Rainey. He's the one who really forced it together. He, he, I think he just basically browbeat Yamaha into sponsoring the deal and putting up the money to make Laguna Seca a Grand Prix venue. We needed to do about $3 million worth of safety improvements for the riders, and, and Yamaha was right there. After months of renovations, Grand Prix Racing returned to Laguna Seca in 2006. It is the only international race run in the county park. It's a day in a loud park, and people bring their blankets and their coolers, and they sit on the side of the hill, and they watch racing, and it really is a family affair. Yamaha and Rainey share a long, successful history at Laguna Seca. Rainey won three Grand Prix races here. And after he retired, turn nine was named Rainey Curve in his honor. Right before Rainy Curve are turns 8 and 8A, known the world over as the Corkscrew. Very challenging track. There's blind corners, there's fast corners, there's off camber, there's, there's right and left. Uh, the famous Corkscrew. I mean, you can sit in Italy and listen to, to the Grand Prix being uh, broadcast in Italian, and they use the words, the Corkscrew. I mean, it's that type of a, of a venue and a feature. <laughs> Corkscrew is one of the most difficult corners on any racetrack in the world. It is a blind left-hand turn followed by an immediate sharp right as the road drops 300 feet down a hill. You could actually get both wheels off the ground when you change direction. Uh, going down the corkscrew. The corkscrew is one of those things that every lap through it, I don't care how fast or how slow, it's always going to open your eyes and really make you take a big deep breath when you go off of it. Way different mindset going through there than it is anywhere else on the track. He was just such a fierce competitor. He just wanted to win really, really badly. And, uh, and so did Schwantz at the time. That's why the two of those got into some, uh, they got into some pretty heated battles over the years. And I, and I guess the, the problem I had was I was always trying to chase that guy Rainey through it. So maybe the front wheel was in the air, but it didn't really where I wanted it to be. It was the only way I could try and keep him in sight was if I wheelied all the way through it. Wayne Rainey and Kevin Schwantz are two of the heroes for younger generations of American motorcycle racers. I looked up to guys like Wayne and Kevin Swantz, who had these incredible heated battles, plus they're Americans, you've cheered for them. They were your heroes. Today, when professional riders tackle Laguna Seca, they always have a plan of attack for the corkscrew. But amazingly, when they built Laguna Seca, the corkscrew wasn't planned at all. It just happened one day at lunch. All the blueprints were actually drawn up at the end of the day. So after the bulldozers and everything had gone out there and carved their way through, then they decided how the track was going to look. 
The corkscrew happened that way. We got to the top of the hill. The construction boss said, I'm going for lunch. Get down this hill any way you can. The pavers are right behind you, hence the most famous turn in the world, the corkscrew. <laughs> break with le in less than 1.2 seconds to go down to about 60 miles an hour to take a blind left turn. You can't see where you're going. All you see is sky. It's like jumping off a six-story building. Um, you leave your stomach somewhere back on turn six and collect it the next time around. The whole time you're, you're white knuckling. You're scared and you go, oh God, I'm coming into rainy curve. When even the pros admit they're scared of the corkscrew, you know it's a tricky corner, but that's the point. They're built to be challenging. You're supposed to be racing out there, not just driving around. Nearly 6,000 miles to the west is another racetrack with a strong connection to Yamaha. The difference is that this racetrack is private. No one from the public ever gets in. This is Yamaha's private test track in Fukuroi, about 10 miles from Hamamatsu, Japan. Test tracks are even more difficult than race tracks. They're intentionally designed with real-world bumps and oddly shaped corners because the goal is to push new bikes to the absolute limit. Fukuroi, what an amazing world this is. This and other test tracks that uh, manufacturers use, they get a chance to take their production, pre-production motorcycles into an environment that they think they'll be used on. So, for instance, the R1 should be tested on a racetrack. R1 and R6 were both tested at Fukuroi. In fact, since 1969, every bike Yamaha has ever made has been ridden here. Some by factory test riders, others by Yamaha's world-class racers. At the Yamaha test track, they had a straightaway that was just about a mile long that they would test you know, their street bikes and their race bikes. I remember going down the straightaway there, and they had sensors down the straightaway and they could measure trap speeds, acceleration speeds, and it went 206 miles an hour. That was back in 1990. And uh, so we thought we had a real weapon that year. And uh, in that year we did, we went on to win the, my first world championship. What they learned with Wayne Rainey and his prototype race bikes at Fukuroi in the early 90s played a major role in the design of the new R1 and R6 sport bikes for street riders. We have a strong relationship with our racing department. We share the same designers. When we develop a new model, we get all kinds of information, including the latest racing technology. The R6 frame comes straight from what Yamaha engineers have learned from racing. It's strong, light, and remarkably compact. Put that all together, and you have a motorcycle that really likes to carve through the corners. That's great on the street, but at Fukuroi, good handling is an absolute requirement. R6 is a different bike. I mean, of any of the 600s, race bike for the road. You get on that bike, the harder you ride it on the track, the better it works. What really strikes me every time I ride an R6 is how unbelievably quick you can go into and through corners. It just, the chassis is so hooked up, it's got so much front tire communication, and that's what a rider wants uh, at any level. We would like to know what the tires are doing. Sport 
ーツバイクの楽しみ。コーナリング is the most important part of having fun on a sport bike. Our focus is on how fast we can go through corners and how fast we can accelerate coming out of them. There's a direct link between the very first Yamaha and the newest R1 and R6. That link is Yamaha's dedication to Kondo and a design philosophy that has never changed. Simple, light, compact, powerful. Simple, light, compact, powerful. That has been our design concept from the very first motorcycle and it continues today. Even when a designer's idea of beauty threatens to compromise performance, Yamaha doesn't flinch. I'll give you an example. Imagine that a designer creates a beautiful exhaust system, but the shape reduces power. When that happens, we challenge our engineers to find other ways to recover the power. Often, this requires additional effort, but we want to keep the beauty. They've established themselves as a style, which is pretty much unlike anybody else, because they're, you know, it, particularly for a Japanese manufacturer to have that kind of longevity for a design that communicates the same basic excitement from the beginning is pretty unusual. R1 to R6. The R1 and the R6 are not the only special ones. Yamaha has always made motorcycles that focus on the human element. We think that the R1 and R6 are extensions of that philosophy. We have no intention of changing our way of thinking. From music to motorcycles, Yamaha has held true to a unique way of thinking for more than a century. A way of thinking in which a very old Japanese philosophy, focusing on beauty and human emotions, continues to impact the very latest instruments and motorcycles that bear the tuning fork logo. What really defines Rainey in my mind and, and the enthusiast's mind is his absolute passion for racing a motorcycle, uh, his intensity. His intensity, just the way he rides, the way he sits up on the brakes. I can remember when I was racing, I would try to sit up on the brakes like Rainy. I mean, that, that's really the way I thought about it. Have him come in and out of the bubble and up on the brakes and turn the bike and just with that intensity and that efficiency and, and the fastest guy in the world three years in a row. And really someone that I tried to pattern my riding after as much as I could.